think about it. I'll think about it. I've already walked tw- walked out twice on them, so. Oh. Yeah, but that's before you had me for a spiritual that's, son. That's and true. That is that is true. That yeah. is true. All that's right. True. Although, can I say something just to be extra salty? Sure. Because I'm a sinner, but I've walked out on them more times than some people have seen them. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm going to ask Father and Cyprian, do you guys prefer sausage links or sausage patties? Links. Oh, boy. Links, links, links. I think links I for sure. on this. For sure. I got to say links. The only time I have, the only time I can stomach a sausage patty if it's like a Jimmy, Jimmy Dean biscuit, you know? Yeah. It's true. But other than that, it's all about the links. If I can say something yeah. real quick, Cyprian, think about it for just oh. a second more. I have been really digging this thing where I got sick off salmonella a couple months ago. Uh, and ever since then, I have struggled pretty hard with eggs. And the other day, I just like, I can't do it anymore. So I'm taking a break from eggs. I've been doing this thing where I just make like two or three pieces of bacon or sausage on non-fasting days, obviously, and just put it on a piece of toast and just eat that. And that's breakfast and some tea. I'm like, that is perfect. That's, I don't know what the whole bigger, bigger role that I was doing with breakfast beforehand where I needed to have like eggs and toast and I love it. I love it. Eggs is my, eggs is my jam. That's my favorite thing. I just got sick off them too many times. It just keeps That's happening. That's a shame. That's yeah. a shame. Man. This last time I was a doozy too. I think I talked about it Yeah. yeah. on the podcast. I was seeing like patterns like you do when you ingest certain stuff. That's very bad. Yeah. That's what about you, bad. Cyprian? Patties or links? Uh, patties or links, man. Um, I cannot think. I was tr- what I was trying to think of is I was trying to think of a time when I have actually had sausage patties that weren't like some sort of like like Father said, like some sort of a processed sort of mm-hmm. situation Gosh. going on. I can't. Oh no, I have. Oh boy. I, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say patties here. Sure. I'm gonna say patties. I actually have I I and I cooked them up myself, like some organic. Was it no, it was I think it was in New Hampshire. That's where that's where it was. It was in New Hampshire. It was some pork breakfast sausage patties made by this local farmer that we used to get mm. like our farm share from. And she was like, hey, we've got these patties like now. We did these patties like we slaughtered a hog like we've got these patties. They're seasoned and the whole nine. Like, do you want to add those in there however much? Man, I got those and I took them home. Fantastic. But besides that, links. Like in in general, if I I have a choice, I'm going links. But I'm going to say that the best I've ever had was these patties. So I don't want to – I really am loathe to belabor the point, but – doesn't that almost it's like the exception proves the rule agreed 100 percent. yeah 100 percent. yeah 100 so two-parter then second part is because we got like two minutes off that one i hope we get another two minutes off this next question pancakes or waffles 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 yeah yeah waffles i like, are pancakes. I like pancakes sure but waffles i mean man it's like a whole different thing yeah, they're lighter and crispier and yeah mm-hmm. if you do them right if they're not soggy then and it's they're... like playing a video game sure yeah i yeah i'm 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 going pancakes on why this. why is that like playing a video game father i have to bite i'm biting because you can do a whole like uh, it, it's yeah. like tron with the syrup yeah. and going yeah, in the, get it in the little, and... little squares it's so great i would i just want this quarter of my waffle not with syrup on it mm-hmm. i just want, like the contrast between the two it's like the light cycles yeah and then last part is what is your guys's favorite type of toast like oh, sourdough sourdough 
Howard yeah, Dell. There's rye not bread. rye bread. Rye bread. <laughs> You're constantly disappointing me, man. Uh, I don't know what's going on with your palate. I don't, I like, just I don't like shrimp, and I love rye bread. I, oh, this is. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you don't like rye bread? Not rye's at all. Rye's good. Rye's not good on a Reuben. Yes, that's no. Good. I think it's but the, yes, that's not just by itself. No. Not just nine by times itself. out of ten. Nine times out of ten, if I have a choice for bread, it's going to be rye. That's like wild. One. In fact, I yeah, I'm I'm sorry. Sourdough is fine. It's good, but like rye is like rye and pumpernickel. It's just like mm, poor get about it. I don't know what you're doing here. I I think it again. I think I'm this German. Is, this I'm might German. be a California thing. Is what I think it might be. Yeah, because like San Francisco sourdough, like Northern California sourdough, not going to beat it, never going to beat it, man. And so I think if you're from California, like you're getting the good sourdough, but I get, I mean, German. Okay. I get it. I don't, I mean, I don't understand it. I don't understand it, but I, I'm with it. There's some That's kind of anti-California joke in there somewhere, but I'm not going to stick to that level. <laughs> Us hardy folk that. Oh, whatever. You know, I'm gonna. You know, I will take an English muffin too. Ooh, man, those are good. Those nooks and crannies. The nooks and crannies. I will take. (laughs) I will take nooks and crannies all day. You get like this little Mordor. It's like a little mini Mordor of butter. It's like there's there's just like a little. Like there's one. There's always a nook and cranny. It's so deep. Yeah, it's just a pool. It's 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 like the Mount of Doom, and it's just got it's full of butter. One hundred percent. That's great. I will definitely take an English muffin. And this is the last one. Uh, okay. On your English muffin, what do you guys put? Just like butter. butter. Just, just butter. butter? Jelly. I'll do jelly, too. Sure. I'll maybe have yeah. a little bit of honey, but... Peanut just butter's good, honey. too. Yeah. I peanut mean, butter? so much butter. Okay. Peanut butter. Peanut butter. Too. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Butter. Any kind of bread, peanut butter, I'm good. Like, that's cool. We can Actually, in my youth, when I was younger... I, I worked at a pizza restaurant that actually had a Reuben pizza. Hmm. It was Thousand Island was the sauce instead of pizza sauce. And then they put corned beef and then sauerkraut. And then, no, I'm sorry, a Thousand. And then they put Swiss cheese down hmm. and then corned beef and then sauerkraut and then put a little hmm. bit of cheese on top. And then this was what made it was they pour caraway seeds all over the top of it. So it tasted like rye bread. And it was so good and then afterwards once it was cooked they put a little bit more thousand island they like drizzle drizzle a little bit over the top of it that sounds incredible it it is it, it was sounds like I, a stomach ache but it sounds incredible. i mean you know what i call that pizza the rest of your day because yeah, that's what it is yeah. like it's the rest of your day yeah yeah that sounds incredible all right so we are back to um the creed um okay so i didn't do much pre-pro so I think if we were to tackle the, um, which I think we kind of said that we were going to, and if you guys don't want to, that's fine. Kind of tackle the filioque way um, mm. to some degree. If that's too controversial, we can move on and come back to it because that is the part that I kind of skipped over because I hadn't really done any pre-pro. And if that's, the, if that's what's going to happen, that's fine. Just know I'm going to come at this from a very, very base level. And I, you know, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to deal with it next week? Maybe. Yeah, maybe because it's going to be, I definitely have a, I definitely have a piece of this, uh, the end. So we're, we're on the Holy spirit, right? Mm, Sure. Yeah. Holy spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the father together with the father and the son is worshiped and glorified who spake by the prophets yeah this this who spake by the prophets that's the part that called out to me too yes it's- i was i was hoping to to talk about this the reason for me this has been coming up and so maybe this is a, a jumping off point because it's been really like it's been something the last two weeks in particular has been like just this theme that keeps running because i'm i i it's weird because like in my Last book, I wrote about this, but I'm only just now understanding it, like through prayer, through orthodoxy, through the things that are happening in my life. And that is like how misguided I had been in my whole life thinking that the world was like, that evolution was the thing as opposed to revelation. 
that like things were just here and then they were just evolving and it was kind of like random and it was like they were taking some sort of path and then we look and maybe we can look back and say like oh this is why this happened but it was like an adaptation and an evolution like this materialist thing as opposed to no there's actually like a purpose to things and that purpose is being revealed like over time and this idea of the holy spirit speaking by the prophets is um it's just really really been resonating with me as of late because of that and so i just wanted to talk about this like maybe we could start there father if if that seems like a good place to start like this that just that difference because i feel like this notion of evolution is so pervasive in our culture like even like cultural evolution and these type of things that it like takes all it it takes all like quality the qualitative aspect of like are we heading in the right direction and people are like there is no right direction to head it's basically like what i feel like oh it's just we're, it's just kind of being evolving as we go along and i'm really seeing that like that's actually not the case at all that like that purpose is being revealed all the time so i don't know i if, i don't know if that's a good jumping off point father if you feel like that's sure any excuse we can get to talk about prophet jeremiah i am down because okay. he's been in the prologue a lot and it's just like man he's so cool yeah 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 um i don't know maybe it's in the air because of i haven't seen it yet uh the multiverse madness thing um but i think the thing i want to kind of lead into first and forgive me if it derails derails it bring me back oh, good. you know um but there's um there's a there's this kind of expanding um awareness this expanding attraction um of chaos um and and the you know a kind of notion of chaos and um it's beginning to really in fact i mean it has been because nihilism is a fruit of is nihilism is the kind of direct fruit of of this kind of like giving oneself over to to, to chaos you know um, or someone could, if you want to flip it and say chaos is the fruit of nihilism, however you want to look at it. But these two things are so prevalent, and all I mean, and all of all of all of her children, all of her bastard children, you know, um, cynicism is a fruit of this. All all of these things um, are are infecting us to such a, an alarming degree to where people, young people whose nature should actually be anything but cynical. It's like, it almost feels like they were hatched in it. It's just, it's people are just swimming in it. And it's really linked to this denial of purpose, of meaning, of design. And you have things, you have certain movements which have undermined the truth of purpose and meaning and design. Like for instance, um, I don't wanna necessarily attack it per se, but I can at the very least say that the, the kind of derivative associations of it, the purpose-driven life are so negative to people. They've left such a bad taste that Christians, Christians, right? Christians will find, them, find themselves falling all the way into a kind of overcorrection and this uh, a soft kind of like chaos and nihilism, you know? Um, and, and someone might say that I'm, I'm being a bit extreme, but I'm not because for many people, they feel when, they, when you start talking about um, purpose, design, meaning, and I'll, I'm, I'll get to the prophets and the Holy Spirit in a second. Um, people start to fall into the cynicism because they've seen such poor um, understandings at best, if not flat out just error in regards of 
you know, the God's intimate awareness of, of history and, and God's intimate awareness of a person's, you know, personal history. So these things lead people to really find themselves not entering into a proper association and, and grasping of the absolute profound intimacy um, that is experienced in, in the Holy Spirit. I know I sound crazy to some people. No, for, for, no. forgive me, fa- forgive me, Father. It, just just to clarify here. So, so, uh, so, so that I understand you correctly here, that it's like, so, so what's purpose driven life is what, 25 years old, something now mm-hmm. at this point. Mm-hmm. So, and, and we're both kind of from, from that area. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, cause I did definitely, I mean, my family went to Saddleback when it was still at Tribuco Hills. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, um, so, so you're kind of saying that there's a, that there's a backlash directly because of the sort of misrepresentation of God's purpose of sort of the, the, the pattern of, of, of being right. That by, by this sort of set of people who were doing the it prophetic, and all the rest. Yeah. Like the prophetic, what is the prophetic? And those two things are misappropriated primarily in a Christian context through a weird making God your own personal or personal Oracle. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Got it. Yeah, and, exactly. And so the children who are in the wake of that have learned to just be like, oh, that's just so poly, that's so naive, that's so whatever, you know? Um, and and it's it's tough because, you know, there's there's some validity to that, but the, the, one of the problems is, is that, and, and you see this a lot in regards of um, people who have moved from an evangelical context to a, tr- a more traditional context, their understanding the prophetic is still tainted because because of that. You know what I mean? It's it's still pushed to the spark extreme. Almost you almost end up with almost you know like feeling like John MacArthur. Um, I don't want to bore anybody with like, but you know there's these four square guys who are just like um, their view of the prophetic in, in regards of. Um, the life of the Holy Spirit speaking to the church is just, it's all but dead, right? And so, so I'm, I'm going to try, try to tie it together now because I know a lot of people are scratching their heads like, what, what is he talking about? So you have to understand that in the context of the creed historically, what we're speaking about is the church addressing certain errors, i.e. there's two scriptures, the Old Testament, you know what I mean? And that the God revealed there is not like Christ, like, you know, it, it's, it's a different kind of God. And that was, that was an early kind of notion in heresy that, that was bubbling up. But primarily, it, it's to really anchor the revelation of who not just, you know, Christ is. Remember, this is, this is a latter portion in the creed because the pneumatists, the, the spirit fighters, you know, they were coming in now. Um, they were denying the person of the Holy Spirit. So this is brought, this was added into the creed to anchor into, into, you know, if you will, make firm this dogmatic understanding that the Holy Spirit is God and that the Holy Spirit was present from beyond all time, right? And revealed spite by the prophets, right? This is super key, super important because the Holy Spirit has always been in the history of the church, always been in this place of being under attack one way or the other. And the, the first defense, the first kind of wall, if you will, against that is understanding the historical revelation of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit isn't, isn't explicit. His presence, his presence isn't as explicit via the scriptures as let's say Christ is in the New Testament, right? And so for some people, because of that, there's this struggle with an understanding of who the, the person the Holy Spirit is, how do you experience him, all this stuff. So that's why I'm all, hopefully everything I was saying earlier will start to kind of make sense because this plays out, all of the creed plays out in our daily life, which is that's, that's my point with the creed. None of it is just kind of like, 
far removed dogmatic utterings that are like that are like you know kind of on the shelf somewhere they all if you're an orthodox christian they impact your life like deeply right but the fun the foundation the fundamentals are the fact of you know the if you will um the exegetical understanding, which is like it's it's Catholic, universal for everyone. It applies to everyone, and that that's this foundation of historically the Holy Spirit is revealed in the Old Testament, speaking through the prophets. Now, where that leads us though is this understanding of tradition, and this whole section here, as you might remember, Cyprian, like when I do my catechism, this is a whole section where I begin to start talking about tradition in the life of the church, because if you want to understand tradition, especially if you're coming from an evangelical or a kind of not, um, agnostic, you know, background, tradition might kind of be really problematic for you. But you have to understand tradition is the experience of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. That's what tradition is, right? We have traditions, the traditions we hold we hold them because they've been proven and evidence to be the experience of the Holy Spirit amongst us, in us, with us, right? So this is really key because that same Holy Spirit is the same one who spoke to the prophets and uttered prophecy. Now, let me just unpack this real quick and forgive me for way off on a tangent. Let's try to get back, but. No, it's perfect. Um, it's, I, I think you're directly online for it, Father. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I want to I want to talk about prophecy real quick because um, it's important right now. It's coming up a lot. Um, we're in very turbulent times. We're in unprecedented times. There's no doubt about that, you know. And um, a lot of people, I'd like to think more and more people are are feeling less and less reticent to acknowledge that we're in unprecedented times. But we're in unprecedented times for sure, um, worldwide like the history of the church, not just our own little piece of the pie here in the States or in the Western world, the whole history of the church is in unprecedented times. And so because of that, and, and because of, you know, the blessing to some degree of the, pro the proliferation of um, information of the church that wasn't privy to us, you know, there's so much that we can get now because of the internet. So many things have been translated in the last 10 years that have not, not been translated. I mean, things are getting translated all the time. So there's so many, you know, I enjoy them. You know, I enjoy certain channels like Gregory the Coppolite channel, great stuff, you know what I mean? So there's all this great stuff in there. Shout out to, to that channel. Um, but what people have to understand is like, people are becoming more and more familiar with the living tradition of the Orthodox Church as evidence par excellence through the holy elders and the prophetic utterances of the holy elders, mm -hmm. right? And what I would like to say right now is that this is one of the areas where we saw a big divide in the church uh, with the uh, apocalypse, you know, of 2020, right? The revelation, the, the uncovering that happened in 2020. And that is, you have one camp of people who a bit of a harsh, word a harsh characterization but i don't know how else to to say it from my own personal kind of experience in the first hand who have almost a disdain for the elders and they look at the elders and they look at the tradition as the church as superstitious um you know kind of country backwards you know this this quote unquote aspect of orthodoxy they hate you know they hate anything that is um even, you know, relately, you know, remotely related to anything that even has like some authentic tie to asceticism and, and, and that deep tradition of the elder and, the, and this, this monastic experience and, and really the charismatic prophetic aspect of, of the church. And just so we're all clear, when I say charismatic and prophetic, this is this is part of the trap, right? I'm not talking about all those other um, heterodox sects. Like we, one of the hard one of the hardest things for us is there are words that are that belong to us, but but they have they're so loaded, it's hard for us to use. Like 
charismatic, right? Um, that it's a loaded term now, but, but if you wanna understand what it really looks like, you look at the Holy Elders and you look at the experience and the grace of the Holy Spirit moving in them in powerful, many times visible manifestations. That is the continuing tradition of the prophets. Like, would you say, would you say, Father, for, forgive me, would you say that these individuals that you're speaking about who have a disdain for, for the holy elders, would you say that they are, that they are in, that they are in a way either trying to, to push down or that they have a disdain for the mystical aspect? Could, could we, is, is, yeah. what, what is it that they don't, is it the mysticism that they don't like? Is that, is I, I it think, that part of the tradition? I, I think if I, if I could be charitable, what it is, is, it may not be so much a, a, a disdain for mysticism, but it's a it's an idolatry of of academic scholast scholasticism. And they would never say that. They go like, no, no, no. And then they would try to sidetrack this and start talking about scholasticism in a much more you know strict academic sense, talking about you know a post medieval movement in the West. That's scholasticism. You know what I mean? No, no, no. And then they'll throw they'll throw out statements like, oh, you're anti-intellectualism, all that stuff. No, 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 no. But this characterizes, and there's always exceptions, but this this characterizes many, in many ways, like this kind of segment of people. It's it's unfortunate, you know, it's unfortunate, but there's a segment of people who have really rejected the the heart of, of the church. And you know, this this has its roots and you know kind of anti-monastic movements of the 19th and 18th century you know um and and really so much of this is it's it's again it's 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 a love of the world from my ignorant you know worthless perspective but it, i really track it down to like a love of the world and and this desire to like you know what you find is these people they they have a real strong compulsion to want to um, keep up with the world. And they will frame it in terms that sound very charitable and very compassionate and very sophisticated and enlightened. But it, I mean, it's essentially, it's what it is. You know what I mean? Like the Orthodox priests who are attributing Ruth Bader Ginsburg after she died. Like they are like, oh, this great fighter for justice and yeah. social welfare. And it's yeah. just like, I don't know about that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I just is it is it is it a thought that if if these more miraculous and prophetic things that have happened within the tradition, even in modern times, that if those are acknowledged, that somehow that will minimize the church in the eyes of I don't know potential converts who are coming yeah, who are modern yeah. people. I mean... I don't I think that's the I think that's a very charitable way to look at it. But I would be disingenuous, I think, to say that that's really the kind of um, if I don't want to say it'd be, I don't want to go so far. Like, yeah, I feel it would be disingenuous, disingenuous to say that's the driving motivation. At the very least, you could say that um, you could say that, but you could also say that, you know, there's a real um, and this is something that you find kind of often. Um, again, there's there's just a they view they view this prophetic charismatic aspect of of holy orthodoxy as some again some sort of like folk religion. You know what I mean? And they and they see it as um, yeah, they they just see it as you know a kind of continuation of the of the dumbing down of the people, and there's there's such a um, you know there's there's this kind of value that's disproportionately put on the institution of the church that I think I also find consistent um, in some of these groups, um, and you know. I, I, I can't, I can only speculate to why that is, but I find that they tend to have, you know, you, you can tell because of the, the, the elders that they, generally the elders, they, they don't even want to acknowledge them, but they will tend to have a, a particular distaste for um, like the contemporary elders who have, 
really, you know, won the hearts of the people. And so I think that they find, um, I think that they find these movements almost like, almost like a populist movement and they find it really distasteful if that, if that makes sense, you know what I mean? Um, and it, and it really flies in the face of, because you, you have to take in mind, a lot of these folks, they're making careers, maybe not money, but a name for themselves, all this stuff. They make careers off of speculative theology, but they try to paint it in a kind of quote unquote patristic orthodox light, but it's still speculative. Sure. Right. And, and the elders just, they don't like, there's or, no room for that. You it's more I mean? like intellectually fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there is a place for academic theologians, like true academic theologians, like, you know, uh, John Romanides, you know, he's a great, it's an academic theologian, you know what I mean? Um, Dr. Christopher B. Lemine, you know, like there's these academic theologians, which they, they are a necessary part of the church, but their part of the church is to help articulate and in many ways through that articulation, disseminate the revelation and the tradition of the church in a way to speak to um, the, the current society. So in other words, academic theologians, they have, when they're doing their job right, they very much have their own prophetic aspect. Because let me get back to this. So again, understand prophecy isn't, see people conflate prophecy with soothsaying. Prophecy isn't soothsaying. Prophecy isn't like, oh, I'm gonna tell you your future. I'm gonna tell you, like, there is an aspect of world, like elders and, and you know, people having word of knowledge as inspiration through the Holy Spirit. But when we're talking about prophetic, we're talking about something very specific. We're, we're, we're talking about the exaltation of the word of God in, in, in a call of judgment and repentance um, on, on the world, whether it's, you know, particular people, group, society, time period, you know, but it's, it's, it's the word of the Lord being proclaimed and, and the desire and the hope of repentance and, and in absence of that repentance judgment, that's what, that's what prophecy is. Right. And so then, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it, prophecies are I'm sorry, it, if I understood, prophe prophecies kind of only go down when bad stuff's about to happen. Like when it's like, like they become like mouthpieces for calls to repentance because they're just like, hey, just so you know, Babylon's right around the corner. Like the Babylonians going to snatch you up. Like, yeah, in a, in, a, in a much more, uh, forgive the term, like clinical sense. Yeah, that, that's what the prophetic is. Um, and it's, you know, there's these aspects to it, right? There's things that are characteristic of it, but they're not the thing of himself, like, like speaking quote unquote truth to power, right? That's an aspect of the prophetic, but it's not the core, right? The core is the proclamation of the word of the Lord to, to, to society, to the world, right? that's that's the core of the prophetic and it there's these again there's facets and aspects to it but we have to understand what that is first and foremost and so the so so there's that right Let, let's that's that portion over there but getting back to the holy spirit let us i think we've talked about this a couple of times but let's remember one of the key um aspects the tropos of the holy spirit is the conviction of sin so if you follow how this is connected, and forgive me, I know I'm super non succinct, but the prophets give the word of the Lord as a call of repentance and judgment, you know, repentance and the hope of salvation and in the absence of that judgment. That's what the prophets proclaim. Well, that is primarily a conviction of sin. And so even the, the experience of the Holy Spirit now in the life of a believer, because um, this is a whole thing. I don't know if we've talked about this before, but, you know, Holy Spirit's everywhere, fills all things. And so the Holy Spirit's dealing with everybody, but he indwells within the life of the believer. Through, you know, this is chrismation. Mm -hmm. So the conviction of sin is, is the Holy Spirit's in the world, convicting the world of sin. But that conviction of sin looks very different in the life of a, of a believer, a baptized, chrismated, 
Orthodox, you know, you know, Christian and baptized Christian and Catholic than it is someone who is, you know, not that. Um, and this is important because once you begin to understand that, then you begin to see that the work of the prophets in the Old Testament is, is continued on through the life of the elders. And it's really important because when people begin to poo-poo the elders and they think like, oh, like, you know, they just get caught up in this kind of academic speculative aspect, um, which is not the thing. They, in many ways, un unawares to them, unbeknownst to them, there's a denial of the Holy Spirit, that the action, the continuing very real presence and action of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. Does that make sense? Does that make so, sense? So, kind of laid the, all that out? so the, the, yeah, this is that this, there's something really deep there. And I want to make sure that I have this before, if, before we jump off it, like what, what I'm hearing you say, I think, tell me where I'm wrong here is like the prophets and the Holy elders are like icons of the Holy spirit in a way. And, but that the Holy spirit. So it's like, the way that the prof, the way that a prophet is interacting with society in the world is the way that the Holy Spirit is interacting with a believer in prayer, in a life of prayer. Yeah. So, like in some ways, you could almost. I mean, I mean, we don't have to make it more complicated than than saying they are the mouthpiece of the Holy Spirit, right? So. The, the prophet's function, if, the, if I could use this term, in lieu of that personal gift of the whole, the seal of the Holy Spirit, which is given, which is, again, why one of the biggest things that, like, again, it's almost like if we had a kind of like a, a charter why we're doing this project, right? Like, that's like maybe number two or three on the list is I want people to really understand how profound it is that you have the faith that you have or that if you aren't orthodox yet how profound it is that you are interested in orthodoxy because it isn't about you being smart and you discovering something if you are in the church if you're discovering orthodoxy it's because the holy spirit is drawing you and and the father is, is has allowed it it's calling you period and, and I can prove it to you because there's way more people that are completely blinded to the Holy Spirit, which are probably way more moral and better than you. So why is it that you, I don't know, it's a mystery. Like, I don't deserve to be in the church. I definitely don't deserve to be a priest. So it, it's a work of the Holy Spirit, which is mysterious, right? But it is the Holy Spirit. Like, so the prophets are an incredible mercy. Oh, like they, the, the prophets are like uh, incredible mercy, as are we, the holy elders are like in, in incredible mercy. mercy. Like, I can't remember. I feel like one time we said this. I think this was said at one, one of the past episodes, but like, you know, people have this whole thing about like, oh, God's mean. If there was a real God, you know, if God existed, I'd hate him because he's so mean and this and that. I'm like, man, you have no idea. Like yeah. people have no idea how merciful God is. Like God has given the prophets. I mean, this is the parable, right? The man who's the landowner and lends out his vineyard to these tenants and the tenants, right? When the landowner comes and wants to collect, he sends his servants and they beat, you know, this, they beat the, the servants of the, of the landowner he sends some more, they beat them and kill them. And then finally says, you know what? They'll respect my son. He yeah. sends the son, they kill the son, right? Okay, that's the prophets, right? That's the prophets. And of course, the son is our Lord, right? Like people don't understand that uh, <laughs> God, right? right? If, if, if God really was as people said he was, we, there'd be nothing left, man. That was one of yeah, my you, He wouldn't thoughts. have sent the prophets. He, he wouldn't, wouldn't have sent them at all. He wouldn't have sent them in the first place. Right. He wouldn't have sent I'm them in the first I, place. Like, I got that. Like, I understood that that's what the parable was about, but I didn't get it until just now. Yeah. Like, I didn't, I didn't get it, get it, until, like, just now, and it's blowing my mind, actually. And, like, let me just say this one thing to you, too. This, this is... 
this is another problem, right? Because people can fall into this. Prophet Jeremiah is still speaking. You know what I mean? Prophet Isaiah is still speaking. You know? Uh, I mean, I'll go as far as to say Abel's a prophet. And his blood is still speaking. Right? They're still speaking. That's still mercy. The word of the Lord does not go, does not return void. They're still speaking. To, to, to nations and to individuals. That's what people don't understand. And, and it's crazy to me because the inverse of this, right? We can just go like, oh man, that's heavy. But the inverse of that is so profound because what that means is so many people have been given direct contact with God in regards of like revelation, his divine energies, right? And they're not even aware of it. They just kind of ignore it. They, they, they have a disdain for it. And I would say to you, when you especially understand that the prophetic isn't simply just revealed in the writings of, of the Old Testament, the prophets, it isn't just simply revealed in, <clears throat> you know, the, um, uh, the, the contemporary writings of, of holy elders, it's revealed in their prayers that are, that are still sustaining the world, that are that are keeping God's judgment, right? That's a whole other thing that people don't understand, right? Is that the elders and their prayers still sustain the world? They they, they still I mean they're still praying, right? That that's this is the key. They're not dead. Like they don't they didn't the uh, the prophets and holy elders. They have not ceased to exist. And in fact, if anything, their intercessions are, are way more powerful now. And, and this is an incredible consolation and it's also terrifying because when you take that in account and you see how twisted the world is, you say to yourself, Lord have mercy on us, right? Because it's not twisted because of the lack of efficacy of the prayers of the elders and the saints. And the prophets, it's twisted because of how stiff-necked humanity has become. Do you, if, do you understand that? That where I'm going with that? Because they just refuse to even refuse to 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 hear it, to see it, refuse anything, to feel it. Just a, a flat-out refusal. Refuse, refuse, and everything's contingent upon our free will, right? The prophets spake by the Holy Spirit in the hopes of moving the hearts of men. Yeah, and it usually didn't end well for them. So, no. Um, so, uh, I had a question. Um, so, the idea of of a, of m like modern day prophecy of like, so let's just throw out that like you know <clears throat> there was some um, there was some teachings taught by I think Elder Ephraim and Saint Paisios. And uh, a couple others, I believe, of the stuff that was going to go down in 2020, more or less. And like, um, I, I don't know, it, it's hard. I don't want to get too into it, but I, I, it just keeps coming up. There is this book series. I'm really sorry. Just give me one second called Wheel of Time. And the whole thing is about prophecy. And the whole thing is like, this is what's going to happen. And the thing is, is I used to read that book and it drive me crazy because it's very clear. This will be this person. The dragon will be reborn into this body. And this is what will happen. And this will happen. And this will happen. This will lead to the last battle called Tarman Gaiden, blah, 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 where all evil should be defeated forever or not, you know? So it used to drive me insane when I would read that book because I was like, how are they not seeing that this is what the prophecy is saying because the one of the great things about that book is the manipulation of those prophecies and the interpretation of those prophecies and how people would warp this different sex within like the quote-unquote magic using community would like come and like try and use it for their own ends and try and like i don't know like bridal the dragon reborn who's supposed to be this unbridable thing, this, this creature, this, this man that could not be tamed. And then, then 2020 happened. 
And then I was like, oh, I get it. Because people were suddenly starting to like, well, this isn't really confirmed that he said this. Who really knows what he was saying? And I was kind of, I kind of, did you have something? I, I've, I, I don't know. I've read that whole chapter. I've got the book in here, St. Paisios. And sure. I don't know how anybody could read that entire, you got to read the whole chapter. And it's just, I don't know how anybody could read that whole chapter and not be like, that's what exactly book? what's happening. Like what exactly. Book? What book it's, are you uh, talking it's about? The spiritual, it's the spiritual councils. And I think it's volume three, but the chapter is called signs of the times. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So Cyprian has laid it out that it's pretty obvious what what St. Paisios was talking about. And my question to Father is, is this again just a replay of what's always happened? Is this is this something new of like this like kind of denial of what some of these undeniably holy people have said? And not only that, but like the mere fact of calling that stuff into question in the first place of being like, well, he only got a fourth grade education, you know, like St. Paisios, he was holy. He was a very good man, but he wasn't like learned it. He wasn't intelligent. You know what I mean, father? I like, are you following me? Am I, am I way off base here? Yeah, no. I mean, I, I guess the thing to understand, number one, the elders and the prophets, like they don't give dates right that's that's the other thing yeah they don't they don't give dates right um so that, that's one thing the other thing is um understanding the cyclical nature of these things um and understanding that that that's part of their power is that they apply beyond just this kind of like narrow myopic linear perspective right so it's like there are many antichrists and there's still one to come right mm -hmm. and not to cop out because I'll, I'll go there with people right now like the prophecies of saint Paisius and basically people you know specifically with him but because he's the probably most well known but we can talk about saint gabriel in georgia whose prophecies are insane right um who I, have a, I have a personal devotion to saint gabriel so like people's um, tendency to malign them, to undermine their word, to me is evidence of their holiness. And, you know, I will tell you that the, this kind of um, apocalyptic nature and apocalyptic, I don't mean this in the, in the kind of like, contemporary understanding of it, but of a more traditional sense of the revelatory aspect of, of prophecy. It's, it's presented in the personhood of St. Paisios, of St. Gabriel, um, and of other elders in such a way, hear me on this, that's appropriate for us because of our weakness. It's appropriate for us because of our weakness, because our, our ability to hear a, a, a difficult word, our ability to wield a prophetic utterance from a holy elder is so limited, right? That oftentimes I find God uses, um, God uses his, his holy elders, his prophets in such a way that a number one, um, make no mistake that it's God speaking through them. So what I'm trying to say is I'm answering this, this, this accusation of, oh, St. Gabriel, he was, he was, you know, mentally deficient. He was, you know, he was slow or, you know, um, he was cognitively damaged after the communists beat him, you know, mm -hmm. or when people will say, St. Baezia, she only had a fourth grade education, like all, all of this nonsense, right? I'll go, okay, fine, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. And that proves the point even more sure. because God speaks through limited broken vessels. And if you want to discredit St. Baezia or St. You know, Gabriel or anyone else on those same criteria, I'd say you're proving the point. 
because God is using vessels that that you can make no mistake that their utterances are of Him. Does that? Did you see where I went with that? You yeah. See yeah. And that's absolutely that kind of answers the whole thing because it, it. I guess I had assumed if stuff like that was happening, but this is before I've been Orthodox. Everyone would acknowledge it and recognize it for what it is and move on with this surety. Do you know what I mean? Like this, like ability to be like, okay, we, we uh, venerate holy people and holy people are saying these things. And I guess I just don't know. Well, I mean, I know where that division comes in, but I also don't know where that division comes in. Like, can I say one more thing too? I'll, I'll give you another one. Like, uh, I don't want to, I'm not dampening his, his personal, uh, charism, uh, but Metropolitan uh, Neophotus of Morphe, right? Like he's basically relaying stuff that he hears from an, a holy elder that he knows, right? Mm. But I, I just want to—I just want to say this: like, do we know who that holy elder is? I don't know who he is. Okay. I don't know who he is, but I'm sure someone out there has their speculations. But point being is, um, it's kind of an example, and like this is—I'm not. I, I'm not throwing shade at all, right? I'm just kind of proving a point here. Um, the Metropolitan, His Eminence had said when he was talking about um, COVID or, or if I can say that the virus or whatever, uh, and he was basically saying like, it's gonna like disappear, like boom, like as quickly as it came, it's gonna quickly disappear. And then we'll have, then we'll start beginning moving into a war. If I remember correctly, you know, um, I can't remember what month he said it would. He said it was going to be, I think he says like August or something like that. But the problem was there are some people, I saw some people were like, oh, see, he said this in that time. And, and I would just say, this almost proves the point, right? It's, it's not his eminence is giving the word, it's this holy elder. But on top of that, like this is also another reason why elder, you know, saints and elders don't give dates because it's it all it's all in flux, right? So in other words, it's like, okay, yeah, it wasn't like August, it was like May, right? Or 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 excuse me, a March, right? But it happened just like you said, just as quickly as it came, it was gone. It's like, and we all know because of you know Ukraine and Russia that that magically made COVID go, but that's how it was. And he was that. Elder was correct. I would just say, you know, probably his eminence took some liberty and throw that threw that in there in regards of like some, a date, like a month ish thing. Well, couldn't but, also repentance change that? And you, that's exactly oh, where I was going to go. Which is another aspect that people don't realize about the prophetic is that it isn't static. It's very much a fluid thing, right? Because God wants to. God gives those utterances so that people repent. He doesn't give it so that he, he doesn't enjoy watching people bite their nails and lose their minds, right? He gives it so that people would repent. And so perhaps, you know, you'd like to think that actual repentance maybe kicked the can down a couple months or who knows, whatever. But repentance is a thing. And so depending on the repentance of the people, it can it can elongate or, or, or shorten a judgment, right? And so that's also very important to take in mind. If you don't believe what I'm saying, read the book of Jonah, right? God sent Jonah to the Ninevites. Jonah didn't want to go because he knew that, you know, he had an idea that they would repent. They repented. Jonah hated the Ninevites and God spared them. You know, they eventually fell back into their sin, but point being is God spared them their repentance you know well there's an interesting uh for for that uh saint paisios it, the uh the prophetic word that he had i think uh, when i've heard people talk about it they want to talk about like the how close he was with all the the digital currency and the digital id and all of this mm -hmm. but it's interesting because the part that they leave out that i that for me was the most profound was the person who's asking him because th all these volumes is just people who were visiting him. You know what I mean? And, he, and, and what he's just saying to them that the person says, well, well, what, sh like, 
about the currency, like about this mark, like what should we do? What, how, how do we deal with it? And he says, oh no, the, the people who don't take it, God will protect them. Mm-hmm. God, he's like, this is the most important part. He's like, just don't take it. God will protect those people. Like he'll, he'll keep them fine. He'll, mm-hmm. he'll protect them. And the, the, the person asked him like, elder, like how, like how? And it's interesting because he says, you know, at first, when I first got this, I didn't know either. I didn't understand this part of it either. And then he says, but then I, but then I was, it's, the, it's translated as telegram, but then he gave me the telegram talking about mm. uh, God gave me the telegram. And mm. I'm like, Oh, this, he doesn't go on any further. Like, mm-hmm. I guess they didn't press him any further. It must've been mm-hmm. profound to them when he said that, mm-hmm. but it's just like, I found it very interesting that, that it really is that call to be like, Nope, now's your time to say no. Mm-hmm. Like that's the repentance that it's like, no, no, no. If you'll say no, mm-hmm. God will keep you. Mm-hmm. It's like, he just offers, like, <laughs> yeah. we could go, we could worry about, oh, we got to stop this. We got to, yeah. but really what he's saying, the prophetic word is like, just say no. Yep. Here it's coming. Just say no. God so will keep you. That's it. It's that's a, it. <laughs> that's it's it. a great, it's a great, it's, uh, it's a great litmus test to see where someone is at too. Mm-hmm. Because like, like we have talked about before, like, it would be and this is something that father has talked with us as a as a community at length is this is this idea of like okay if we are starting to kind of get closer to some stuff going down there's no need to panic panic is not what we're talking about panic is never what we're talking about because panic disturbs prayer and like if you're panicking if you're if you're worried about like i this this notion of the the oh man i of course i forget the the image no the idea of scarcity not scarcity itself but the idea of scarcity this image father used a phrase the other day i can't remember what the projection of scarcity Mm -hmm. or something like that where people perceive that if i don't go right now this is it Mm -hmm. and i and me and my children will suffer which is you know that's what always gets me that's what scares me is toilet paper shortage exactly Toilet paper. Exactly, it. exactly exactly and i mean god obviously must know what he's doing because i mean like there are times where you know stuff started to get shown to me and i panicked you know i was just like oh my gosh you know like i was so absolute i set up home alone style traps in my house the night of the election because I was like, if when someone breaks in my front door, I'll hear the glass shattering. And I've got like my katana and my bow and arrow at the top of the stairs. And I was like, and I, and I'll be ready to go, you know, but I mean, that's obviously you thought you, you, thought you were in the purge. You thought you were in the movie, the purge. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a very, very good way of putting that. I really thought like, I didn't know what was going to happen. And I was need to all like repenting of my wokeness and stuff. So I was like, you know, I wasn't like all like corn dogged up to like, you know, go kill like Merc a fool or anything, but I was like, no, I'm going to do what I have to do. <laughs> but I mean that. And so then that, that kind of actually kind of segues into the question I had, because here's something that's really bothered me is the invocation of the word prophecy and guys, if you don't know by now, I'm not a big fan of both sides. So I'm just going to say to everyone who's listening, I am not, I'm not coming against anyone in particular, but the, the invocation of the word prophecy for this whole, the, the Trump presidency, that there is this prophecy written by this like fireman. I don't really know the whole thing that Trump would lead us into this, like, eight years of a golden age or something like that and how that didn't come true. And I wanted to know, because I had talked with someone I trust spiritually and they said, well, it was a prophecy. Maybe it was you father. Maybe it was, I think maybe it was, it was like, Oh, it's a prophecy, but it's not from God. And like that led into this whole thing of, I was listening to father Cosmos talk about this monk who had fallen in to deception and the way that his abbot tried to get him out of that deception was to ask that his guardian angel, quote unquote, who was talking to him, uh, like who some something really trivial, but it was in the future. But demon, the demon turns out the demon was not privy to the future. Mm-hmm. So 
I guess that's that's a rule of thumb is, is that demons are not privy to the future. So then I not have the to... way that people understand it. They are privy to the future in, in, in relation to how we understand the future, but not in the way that people attribute it to them, if that makes sense what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah, because it's like I, I, there, it's like my way of seeing the future. My kids will probably be tired after swimming all day. Something like that, right, Father? Like my kids went swimming this afternoon. They'll probably be tired. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, because it, it, they've it, been around for thousands of years. Though. Yeah, it's 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 a mixture of that, and so that is knowing behavior. So that the demons know human behavior better than we do, right? And so in that sense, they're able to predict certain patterns because they know our nature. But there is another aspect in regards of them, them what perceives to seem like the future to us in regards of if I was at the highest point of the city and I was, you know, looking out on the city and I was like, oh, here comes your mom, Andrew. You're like, I don't see her. Like, I would <laughs> see her because of my vantage point does does that make sense yeah. but like yeah vantage point yeah, if yeah. you didn't know any different like oh my gosh like how did you you know what i mean well it's also like how a major league hitter right mm -hmm. so like a major league baseball player can uh knows what pitch is being thrown when it yeah. leaves the pitcher's hand but they've done all kinds of tests to be like there's actually no way that the eye could perceive like that your eye could perceive that that's a, a fastball uh, in that amount of time. There's actually no way that your eye could perceive it. And so it's like, oh, well, what is happening? And it's like, well, he's seen so many pitches. Mm -hmm. He's seen so many pitches that it's just mm -hmm. like, no, that's a fastball. You know what I mean? Because of even if it's a, a pitcher he's never seen before, because he's just seen so many pitchers give, do so many pitches. Right. And I, I would say this too, in regards of like, when we talk about prophecy, um, this is really important because so many people don't know the parameters of prophecy. Therefore, um, you know, the scripture says in like Thessalonians, do not despise prophecy, right? So because people don't know the parameters they fall into despising prophecy, they, they fall into this. And it's especially true for the Orthodox because again, that's something for the charismatics, that's something for the evangelicals, that's something for the gypsies, or I don't know what they think, you know what I mean? But um, so, but, well, so and what I mean by orthodox, I mean like the um, the aforementioned intellectuals, like academic. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember, you know, whatever term we want to use for them, but like, yeah, the 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 people in the cathedrals, you know, well, not the cathedral, like the uh, the people in the um, theological schools. No, um, uh, uh in the towers, the people in the towers, you know, and the kind of like Ivy Towers of academia. Oh. You know what I mean? Excuse me, that's what I meant. Because sure. you could use cathedral, but when you're in our context, like you- Yeah, that's the, you're <laughs> using the mold, mold buggy in uh, yeah. cathedral, right? As yeah, opposed, yeah. yeah, but it's, yeah, that might, people might be like, what? what? <laughs> yeah, so I knew where you were that. going, but I'm glad yeah. you corrected that. Yeah, we, yeah, could yeah, call yeah. Them, <laughs> we could call them the, the high tower docks. There we go. Yeah. Think about that. that. You yeah. can have that, Father. That's um, I actually don't know if that's that clever. Um, but so then I had to ask, like, uh, I have to ask because I remember. So I'm really sorry. This is long winded. But I remember listening to a podcast and there was a guy who was talking about and it was a comedic podcast. Had nothing to do with anything spiritual. But he's talking about how he was on like a camp out, like a youth Christian camp out, like as a kid. And they were doing like an altar call thing out in the woods, you know, like the acoustic guitar fire, you guys can picture it. And somebody like the youth pastor, someone was basically saying like, I really feel like the Holy Spirit is telling me that there's one more person that wants to come up tonight for an altar call. And like another 10 minutes went by just kind of sitting there silently while that dude's strumming the guitar or whatever. And then he's like, all right, well, okay, well, I guess not. Okay, have a good night. And then the guy jokingly said, so was the Holy Spirit wrong? Like, was that like that the whole notion? Because and then that led me into this whole idea of like, how is there 
that with the people who kind of maybe jokingly got trolled by a demon with the Trump stuff, blah, blah, blah. Or who knows? Maybe it comes back in 2024. I have no idea. But like maybe like trolled by the demon stuff with the Trump stuff. And then the people who are getting trolled, who are like getting whispered in their ear, the discernment of prophecy of like trying to understand, like, is there something we something small us like folks on the street us little folks can kind of look for with that kind of stuff is there some kind of like inner like ooh yeah no that's not right like i i don't trust that right away is there like any kind of advice that or like guidelines that we could follow that was my long long-winded question um like if I hear something and it strikes a certain chord in me, is that something I should be paying attention or should I just not care at all? Okay. Well, the scripture tells us to test the spirits. Okay. Right? And to, and so the way you do that is, you know, if you're just like ran, if you're, you know, I guess start here. Like if you're listening to this podcast, then I guess I can say to you the way that you can test the spirit first and foremost, is you talk to your confessor. Hmm. That I mean, that that's the first thing, right? Because the problem with prophecies is that, well, the, the problem isn't with prophecies. The problem with people in regards to prophecy is that our tendency now, especially because we're so egocentric, and watch this, we are so weak. This this is this is something that um, this is kind of another aspect I was alluding to earlier about. Um, you know, the kind of the, the character, the quality or the character of the vessels that are giving prophecy now, like the elders and stuff now, as opposed to back then, is that like, we're weak. And so we can't take strong drink like, you know, our Christian ancestors could, you know, five generations ago, like we, we just can't take it. So there's a, let, let me give you an example. Let, let me, let me, let me try to pull it out of the abstract um same perfidios you know like um i will give you know there's certain saints i and elders i'll give to people as medicine you know what i mean same perfidios is an elder i give to people because he's sweet he's mm -hmm. very sweet you know what i mean and so he helps people but like just to be clear <laughs> you know uh when you read the, when you, when, at least in regards of what's been translated in English, when you read a, a more kind of summative or culminative, like, uh, when you read more of his work, you, 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 he has some harsh words in there. I mean, yeah. or at least what's perceived by us as Americans as harsh words, right? But typically his, his, his overall character, the, the kind of, um, his own kind of charisma, his own charisma is like very sweet, right? It's because of the weakness of modern people, right? I mean, St. videos, you know, he reposed in like 91 or something like that. And he's especially sweet because of how weak we are. I've talked about this before. That's why, you know, it's, it's you can't really get away with a harsh Pantocrator. Like you can't get away with a harsh Christ in a dome anymore because people are so weak. You know, like, why is Jesus mean? You know what I mean? All this stuff. So the reason why I'm saying all this is because when you begin to understand that, number one, yeah, so go speak to your confessor, test the spirits, right? But also understanding that the testing of the spirits, um, the testing of the spirit is like, you know, is it, you know, of course, in, in the context of the scriptures, that any spirit that said that denies Christ came into the flesh, you know, is, is of antichrist, okay, that, that's obviously there. But I would say to you, one of the ways to always discern is, is it in line with the tradition of the church? Is it in line with what has been revealed to us and has been with us, you know, since, uh, since the time of the creed, let's say, right? And so when you look at how sweet St. Perfidios is, it's not like he's innovated in that. It's not like you can't, it's not like he's so, he's cut from a completely different cloth. Like you can see, you can see the the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that was working through Ezekiel, it was working through Morpheus. Mm -hmm. There is no kind of like, you know, um, this is one of the things I, I try to encourage people if they ever want, if they ever, if I ever get a conversation with them, if they're from 
you know, these heterodox traditions, it's like, one of us is wrong, man. Like there, there, there isn't these, the, the Holy, there isn't like multiple Holy Spirits. You know what I mean? And so if you're saying something that's caught, like real simple, if you're saying, I don't believe in the communion of the saints, they're dead and it's wrong to pray to them. We don't have the same God. And I don't, I, I don't know what to tell you, right? Like one of us does not have the Holy Spirit. Just, I mean, just to make it, do you understand what I'm saying? Just yeah. to make it, just to make it really simple, right? So what has the church taught? Well, if you understand what the church is taught, what the traditions are, that's the Holy Spirit. That That's the Holy Spirit speaking. The Holy Spirit is saying, this is how I interact with humanity, right? So just, just to kind of flip it on its, on its end, simple videos, right? This is a good one. Uh, one of his spiritual sons calls him up, right? You know the story, right? One of his spiritual sons calls him up. And he's like, you know, Yoranda, I'm having a problem, blah, 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 blah. St. Porfirios gives him a word, you know, hey, okay, da, da, da. At the end of it, he's like, oh, and um, by the way, you're not gonna, don't call me on this line again. He's like, oh, why? He's like, oh, I've been dead for like three weeks or whatever. Oh, no, I haven't heard that. Oh, my <laughs> yeah. God. Yeah. 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 <laughs> wow. yeah yeah okay i'm sorry yeah, hold on hold on no no i got more i got more yeah i have one too i i got more how is it that saint porfirios saint sophroni saint paisios how is it that they knew each other but they never really met how is that right they had met in the spirit right i mean we, we can go we can go on and on and on you know Elder Milianos, who's not even like he's a saint, right? He's a saint, but he's not canonized. Elder Milianos, right? How is it that, you know, we have an abbess, we have a Yorondisa here in the States, Yorondisa Emiliani, who, you know, is named after him. This Kansas City sky bridge fell on her, folded her in half, like, you know, it's a miracle she didn't die, but like folded her in half, you know, like her head in between her legs, right? Because this bridge collapsed on her, right? And basically, you know, kind of long story short, you guys can look it up. There's an incredible interview of her. And, you know, this this monk is, you know, kind of like helping direct people to like, well, they didn't know it was a monk. It's a man in a robe with a beard. Like, what's he doing in Kansas City, right? And this is in the 80s, whatever. It was Elder Emilianos who at the same time that in the happen was serving liturgy on, on Athos, right? So like, that's, I mean, you wanna talk about Holy Spirit, you wanna talk about, you know, uh, charismatic, you know, all you IHOP people and all that stuff. You don't, you don't, you, I mean, you don't even know the half of it. I mean, St. John Maximovich, I mean, we, how many crazy miracles can we talk about Vladika John, right? I mean, and Vladika John, right? What does he say? Don't pursue uh, experiences, but repentance. You know what I mean? So it's like, oh, we we totally believe in, in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and and in fact, we experience, you know, the the full manifestation. Of the I mean, like I said, don't call me on this line because I've been dead three weeks or whatever. You know what I mean? Top that, right? But here's the thing: the emphasis isn't on that. The emphasis isn't on the sensational aspect of it. The emphasis is on the power of God and repentance and, and the fact that the resurrectional life is real and the saints and the people of God participate in the resurrectional light. That is the word of the prophets. That is ultimately what they reveal to us. It's a message of, of hope, hope in God. I needed that. Yeah. I, I needed that. Really, seriously. Yeah. Well, I, th I thought I had a neat story, but that's <laughs> fine. I mean, yeah. But yeah. And, and I would just say this too. And I don't know, you know, whatever, but um, it doesn't take much. You know, like it's really important to understand that, um, you know, Christ isn't looking towards our success because we don't have any. Mm hmm. Like one of the best men, 
God help me. One of the greatest moments in your life is when you will come to realize truly without any affect, with, with, with all sincerity, that you really are a wretched sinner. And that really the only reason why you have any ounce of goodness in your life is because of the mercy of God. Once you have had that realization, that's what's missing from a lot of people. Because a, a lot of Orthodox folk, unfortunately, they're moralists and they are, you know, um, you know, they're caught up in their intellect. Um, and so they think they're good people. I'm gonna tell you right now, you're not a good person. You're not, you're not a good person, you know? Um, I, I strive to, ma to, to, to maintain the freedom Christ has given me. And I'm not, glor you know, um, I'm not glorifying in sin, you know, lest it's like, God forbid, that's not what I'm saying. But the realization that like, you really truly are weak and sinful and broken and that it's only by God's vivifying, redemptive, sanctifying power that you have any vision, any life at all, that's so liberating. And, and again, that is the prophetic, if you understand what I'm saying that that's ultimately when you experience that you are participating in that prophetic utterance of the apostles and of the elders right when you when you humble yourself in this humility is this this radical act this radical experience of honesty if that makes sense right and this is what god is at any one of the prophecies in the in the old testament the prophets if Israel would just, at any point in time, the people are like, not even like stop what they're doing, but just acknowledge, you know what I mean? If they were to just at least acknowledge, like, yeah, you're right. You know, that's all God's asking of us. That's why confession is so powerful, which is another direct place to test prophecy and to really experience the prophetic is in the confessional. When you come into the confessional, like I've said before, don't justify yourself. Like, you know, and this is this is a hard one. There's, I, there's a lot of people who don't know how to confess properly. It's it's a hard, it's not, it's not something you wake up and know how to do. And there aren't really classes on it. Although I've been thinking about giving one, like there's like, uh, if you can just learn to not justify yourself in the confessional, man, it's like, um, you guys wouldn't know this, you know, and, and it's my fault because, you know, I, I'm, I'm a lazy person and my wife does so much. But, you know, my shower has like these calcium deposits in the in the shower head, you know. And so some of the water kind of like doesn't get all the way through. You know what I mean? Sure. When you justify, that's what's happening. The water's there. The water wants to come out, whatever. But your negligence, your pride, man, pride is... I, Man, pride is a thing, man. When you justify, it plugs up the hole and it keeps the water from coming and washing you. And it is, it's so powerful. I just want to get some of that CLR stuff and just like, like pour it in a bowl and just stick my shower head in there and just like, sure. it just, and, and. I thought you were talking it. about taking CLR to the confessional. I was like, yeah, I mean, that'd be cool. I mean, you know what I mean? Never, because yeah. I, I, I've seen this happen. I've seen people. Not many, not many, and it's my fault. It's not. It's not their fault. It's my fault because I don't. I don't teach enough on it. So everyone forgive me. But I have had a couple experiences where I've had people come back after I've either prayed for them or, or gently tried to admonish them about justification. And it's such a. It's just like a dam has opened. Because that justification robs people of so much grace in the confessional, right? If you just get in there and just like, yeah, I did this. Don't try to, well, this is why I did it. Because don't, don't do that. Just, this, is, this is what I did. You'll find some incredible stuff happening. And I would just say, this is the thing with the prophets. You know, every word that they gave the nation of Israel, if they were just like, yep, like, God is there to just clean us up and, and to, you know, I'm not saying that he does everything for us because he wants us to, you know, participate, but you get what I'm saying, you know, 
this is this is like a real key thing because people another example people will will they'll get kind of like a word of knowledge or or the lord will speak something to them through someone maybe their godparent maybe their priest maybe their spouse and they'll know it's god but they'll just kind of like harden their heart you know what i'm talking about they're just like harden their heart about it and that's that's a whole other thing too because you can feel it father you can feel it yeah you can you can feel those moments when it's like oh that's really from the lord oh mm-hmm. boy mm-hmm. oh boy and then it's like now for me you know that's the and it's in the beginning it hurt so much it was so there was such a high level of discomfort but now it's like i don't now i've just learned that it's like no 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 there's discomfort because you're not listening like if you would just if you would just stop and acknowledge it and just listen like the discomfort goes away immediately but yeah i i yeah that's that's been part of my own journey is like okay yep that's definitely and then you know my own pride my own ego whatever like no 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 but now it's just too painful Mm -hmm. because i I would just say this forgive me i because i am such a wretched broken sinner myself i just i know and i've experienced god's mercy i'm god is not wanting to punish like god's not wanting to torture us and so what is so hard for us because of our pride and our egoism to just kind of like let God in to just expose ourselves. He just wants, I mean, we think that we would feel, but we, we don't, we feel so much worse. We feel so much worse, you know, but when you let go and you allow God to really lead you into that place of being open and washing you, it's incredible. The, the freedom and the lightness that you experience is just, it's incredible. You know, what's wild father. And <sighs> as, as we have these conversations is that like all of these, and I can just, I don't want to do this because there's been even comments of people that like, I need to may, I don't know, maybe I need to be more charitable to like the he- heterodox, whatever, that this, this, this is just my own thing. Right. Like, but all of these words, like, you know, let go and let God, Jesus take the wheel. Like all of that is, has been there in the conversation my whole life, but it's been bumper sticker slogans. Yeah. Whereas like what we're talking about right now is that, Mm -hmm. except it's the real thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's a real practice, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. of that there's a way and a means to do it. And it's not just like, Oh, it's just the answer to like, yeah, Jesus, take the wheel. Like, let go and let God and like, yay. And then now like bring out the praise and worship band. It's like, actually, mm-hmm. like that let go and let God thing, it, it really hurts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, especially yeah. if you're not used to doing it, it's yeah. so scary. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah. then he, 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 he shows, he, he shows, you know, but it's like, it's still scary. Yeah, you, you know, know? I- I just, to make a connection to, I mean, this is kind of redundant, I guess everyone realizes this, but the necessary preliminary movements of humility, they're built into the tradition, which again is evidence of the Holy Spirit, right? Like you walk into an Orthodox church, right? Even the most, you know, ratchet, (laughs) if I can use that term, kind of like, you know, parish, whatever, who's just kind of like, you know, a bunch of conference just kind of scraping along there just the the lowest bare bonest amount of humility and reverence and and like the most craziest parish that is light years difference than just high society in america you, are you following mm-hmm. what i'm saying it's 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 100%. built into the tradition it's built into it because God isn't some like, he's not threatened by us. The humility that God asks of us, it's like the hazmat suit, if that makes sense. God's not like, well, how dare you, blah, blah, blah. God's like, look, man, like, you don't really know what I am. Not even who I am. You don't know what I am. And to you to enter into my presence in an improper way is death for you. 
Mm -hmm. Humility is the kind of, you know, it's the hazmat suit for holiness, right? It's humility is, is the thing that allows you to enter into the presence of God, the awareness of God and the heavenly things without completely being, you know, turned inside out, you know, and it's built in in such a way that when you begin to understand this idea of like letting go, like all things you're saying, like the reason why they're not bumper sticker slogans is because they're not cheap. They don't, they don't just come to you like, oh, this is kind of a little cool, like little thing, whatever. And it's like, forgive me, I'm, I'm going to go through real quick just because I think it's, appro it's appropriate, right? My disclaimer is I find a lot of value in the 12 step program. I find a lot of value in it, right? My bachelor's, my undergrad is, is in addiction science, like whatever. I'm, I'm not knocking it, right? But I just got to say this, right? There are things that um, you just don't get within a, there are things that you just don't get outside of the life of the church. You Amen. may get you may get all kinds of beneficial things, but this core thing, which is why therapists will only take you so far. I'm sorry, I gave this whole sermon, whatever, but I'll say it again. Therapists only take you so far. 12-step programs only take you so far. Self-help programs only take you so far because there's certain things that you cannot understand or experience unless you enter into properly right because they're because they are things that belong to god and so the so the holy spirit being evidenced in the life of the church what's built into this is this kind of humility which is necessary to receive prophecy like in order for you to receive prophecy there has to be a modicum of humility and that's that's what stings people that's what caused them to reject prophecy is the lack of humility if you're following what i'm saying right and so when you have humility, you're able to accept these things. And when you accept them, then the work and the process begins, right? And it's, and it's beyond just the kind of like fixing of a behavior. Mm. Because it's, you wouldn't want, because if it's real prophecy, you don't want it in some ways. Like mm -hmm. you don't want to be a prophet. Like oh. it's not something that you would want to aspire to. No, 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 no. Which is why people have in classes, mm -hmm. classes, which is a real thing. like. That's a real thing. People having prophecy classes. Well, teach you how to prophesy. It's it's just not only is it baloney. I, th I think I I think I've seen T D Jakes offering those over the years. Yeah. It's it's not only baloney. It's it's dangerous. Yeah, you don't know who you're talking to. It's dangerous. Humility is really practical too. I remember that um, the limited amount, and I don't. I honestly am not just trying to sound humble. Like literally, the the little amount of humility I do, it, it does go a long way. When I'm able to just not argue against an accusation all day, every day of my life, and just say, "Yeah, you know what? That's probably true." It's amazing how quickly that you know. I I don't I don't know what happens there, but whatever that thing is that's been following me around, like just yelling in my ear, just seems to just like just like, oh, I can't be here anymore. And then he just like takes off, you know, like to a degree, you know, to a degree. But like, that's one of my favorite things is, uh, you know, that uh, it was a work thing. And basically there was a big meeting and I was on the wrong side of an issue. And it really bothered me on the drive home. And then I was just like, you know what, I was on the wrong side of that. And then, you know, end, end of end of inner, you know, inner conflict end of it you know it just came out and it was just like and I went up to a dude you know who I already kind of struggle with at my job and I told him I was like you know you were right man you were right like I was wrong about that situation and like there was peace there you know it's just it's practical and you know even like in early sobriety like eating like a ton a ton of like really gross food for breakfast and be like why do I feel like garbage and it's like it's the food it's the food and I'm like no it's not it couldn't be that it couldn't be that I'm allowed this one little thing, you know, I can have this one little, you know, thing I can still hold on to. And then eventually just being like, it's the food I'm eating really gross, you know, like not good food in the morning. And of course, like, I feel like garbage all day, like, and then from that, I'm able to take something and like move on with my life and be like, oh, some smaller breakfast are sometimes better, 
you know, like maybe too much coffee in the morning does tend to jolt your nerves around one or two in the afternoon, you know, just take it easy. So I, I don't know. That's just been, it's just practical. You know, it, it tends to be like, cause the, the parable I referenced, the one that I had the biggest visceral reaction to so far as the being, you know, at the wedding feast and sitting above your station and then the server having to come and tell you like, you're actually way, way back there and having to stand up with your plate and walk all the way to the back. I was driving when I heard that the first time, not like the first time, but really somebody explained uh, what it meant. My knuckles were like white on the steering wheel. I was like, oh my gosh, that is so visceral. That is so like, just that walk, just like with your like little like food on your plate, just like walking back to sit in the back. And it's just like, man, yeah, I've I've absolutely had I don't know what the exact situation was, but I've had a situation like that. I, I cannot recall it, but I can only recall the feeling Yeah, where like I was sitting in a place and it was like a place reserved for like individuals of honor, like <laughs> some like, you know, a, 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 some elder of a family or like a CEO of a company or like a board of directors or something. And I'm just sitting there thinking, I can't, and I can't even remember what it was, but just the person coming over to me and just the very, they're very polite, but in the, their communication was like, you just like the, the 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 you know what i mean they're very polite about it but the underneath it was like you are the most uncouth <laughs> dumbest ill-mannered individual i have ever encountered in my life and how dare you i shouldn't you shouldn't even be here and just you like even breathe everybody yeah. like it was a room full of people and everybody watching me like stand up and skulk away and it's talking about a walk of shame man oh my goodness that's oh my goodness this is the last you'll hear most likely the story you'll hear from me tonight so i'll make it count but my the priest who baptized me um father james he talked about how him and his wife uh were going to a party and they didn't know it was supposed to be as uh well dressed as it was and so they kind of just walked in, you know, I'm imagining like shorts, maybe some flip flops, something like that. I don't, I don't know, but I'm imagining it's something like that. And his wife just like instantly like 180 back out the door when she walked in and realized she was not dressed well enough for this wealthy thing that was going on. I just turned around, went back out and he walked outside and he was just like, that's the wedding garment, the mm. wedding garment. You don't have the wedding garment on. You're going to feel like that but a million times worse wow. later on. That's the wedding garment you don't have. And I was just like that again, one of those, it's just social embarrassment. I guess maybe that's one of my things. It's just like, man, it's harsh, but I mean, I just felt that not too long ago. Really? Yeah. I went to, and it's just, it's clicking for me right now. I'm like, Oh Lord, forgive me. Um, I went to a wedding, wonderful wedding. And, uh, <clears throat> no excuses you know i just i knew better and i showed up but i didn't have uh, my gb my my uh, my uh you're awesome there's like a outer robe that you know priests wear for like whatever you usually see this wearing it during vespers or never get vespers yeah and like yeah i didn't have that and like for whatever reason i was wearing my raggedy hat you know and like it was just like Everyone was gracious, no one cared with her, but like the whole time it was hot in the church, but I wasn't sweating because it was hot. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was like not having the wedding garment, like you say that, like this just happened a couple of weeks ago. I was like, oh man, yeah. Like have that wedding garment, man. Have I'll it. give you, I'll give you the flip. I'll give you the flip. Meeting the governor here. Uh, we, I was invited, m myself and Alex, who you know, father, mm -hmm. we were invited just a few months here. And it's just like not knowing the culture, right? Just a few months here, we're invited like, hey, uh, I'm going to have a friend of a friend. I'm going to have dinner. Uh, I'm going to have the governor over for dinner at my house. 
why don't you come over to our house and, uh, for dinner? And so I'm like, whoa, I'm going to meet the governor. Okay, cool. Um, so we got all dressed up. I, you know, I brought some of my, I, I never wear them, but like I have my nice watches and everything put on like real expensive, like Breitling, you know what I mean? I had like a <laughs> little suit, a little coat jacket, you know what I mean? Had on some chinos and the whole nine, some boots, <laughs> you know what I mean? We come in and I remember the hostess opening the door and she's like in a t-shirt and shorts. She like looks at both of us like, okay, like come in. I'm going to like take off my boots and it's nothing but like flip-flops slippers as they call them here. Like of all the guests there is all flip-flops. And I was oh, like, God. Oh, and I'm taking it off. I've got dress socks on the whole time. <laughs> and she's like, Oh, it's okay. You can like leave your shoes on, I guess. And I'm like, no, no way. But she's like, well, but we're going around out in the back. I, it was just, it was an absolute mess. And then the governor shows up in like a Chicago bulls, uh you know like t-shirt and some shorts with an extra pair of chunklas an extra pair of slippers so he could go out back and it's just like oh i don't i do not know how to like and I, just i'm completely out of place and the governor's looking at me like memo? i'm a crazy person how are you supposed to get that memo yeah for real i don't that one's not on you cyprian i don't think i would have done the exact same thing i would have been yeah, like well but it. i i proved i proved myself to be a mainlander was what i did uh, but right you are. So I, 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 I am, but it's like, um, it's kind of the same thing that it's like, well, you yeah. don't know. Yeah. Like if you're going to come meet the governor, why didn't you ask what you should wear? Huh. Like I could have asked, Yeah. but yeah. I made an assumption. Yeah. Like I made an assumption that I knew yeah. that, that, and that that's a good meeting point. the governor yeah, here yeah, yeah. would be exactly like meeting the governor anywhere else. Sure. Yeah, that's right? a good yeah. point. That's a good point. Because the key thing is, is like, you know, figure out what you need. That's a good point. That's a good point. And it's a lack of humility. Yeah. Because honestly, that's what I was like. Oh, I'm going to meet the governor. I know exactly what I'm going to wear. Mm -hmm. You know, and like just going to like, oh, I'm going to do something impressive. And it was just like pure pride mm -hmm. knocked down. And I felt so uncomfortable in exactly what I thought I would feel puffed up in. Right. That's interesting. That's interesting. You know? Yeah. Really strange. Really strange experience there. That's interesting. All right. I'm going to wrap it up. But before we wrap it up, uh, we had actually talked off air that we're going to try something new, uh, which is rather than um, me just ask another question, we're going to start talking about some saints at the end. Um, so uh, I had another idea, which was not not the most well thought out. it would have been a lot more fun i can say that but you know now we're not necessarily here to have fun all the time but um saints, I, are, fun. saints are saints are something i mean but i don't know if fun like i don't think i could have like if i were in the middle of like just a heated awesome legit game of risk you know just like loving it <laughs> you know? and then like saint paisios walked in i would just like just like throw it back in the box and put the box underneath the well, couch and be agreed, like agreed agreed yes yes so agreed. fun is there are much more important things than fun and mm -hmm. things are one of them so um so we figured we'd start it off strong uh i think we'll try and do like a, 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 a every week someone brings like maybe a more obscure saint or someone that's close to their heart because that's probably what i'm going to go with i like um I like a couple of scenes that I want to at least start off with. So, but father. Or someone who's, you know, like I was saying, speaking to the kind of something that's relevant going on, you know, kind of like a topical. 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 Oh, Thank topical. You. That was the other one. Yeah. It was something yeah. that was like Prophet Jeremiah. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to speak. Uh, I'm going to bring forward um, uh, the martyrs Timothy and Mara who uh, we commemorated actually uh, yesterday because, you know, uh, once the sun goes down on the new day. Um, but Timothy and Mara were this uh, newlywed couple who um, essentially were Christians and were, um, you know, brought to trial together. And um, every year uh, when they, when their feast day comes around and uh, thanks be to God this year was able to have liturgy and um, commemorate them and celebrate the liturgy um, this morning. Uh, 
their martyrdom is incredible. And they are um, such a icon of holy love, devotion to each other as shown perfectly and powerfully in their devotion to Christ. This is, this is like, this is the pinnacle of earthly love is uh, Timothy Mar. And it says that Timothy, you know, um, their sufferings are so brutal. They took hot pokers and inserted them into the ears of Timothy. And it says that from the pain, his the pupil of his eye has you know, burst, burst out. And for Mara, it says that, you know, um, first they began to pull out her hair and then they began to um, sever her fingers um, from her hand. And, and they eventually were um, crucified in front of each other. And for nine days, nine days, they, they, they hung from the cross, from their crosses, and they encouraged each other from their crosses until finally, you know, they surrendered their, their souls to, to the Lord. Every year, it's just, God help me, you know, God help all of us, like, um, the devotion of the saints and, and this married couple, because marriage is such a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, but it's, it's, it's always at its best when it's realized as it was intended to be, which is as an encouragement of each other uh, moving towards the Lord, you know, um, in marriage counseling or enrichment, like I always give the couples this understanding, which is the orthodox understanding, you know, it's like, Marriage isn't about you guys facing each other. It's about the both of you facing towards Christ, mm. moving the same direction. And uh, the martyrs, Timothy and Mara, they are this wonderful example of what that means. So if anyone's interested in reading more about them, um, their uh, feast day uh, is, um, what's the date today? Uh, 16th. Yeah, so, so if in the prologue, you look up on this date, Timothy and Mara, um, I encourage everyone to take a look at at their their hagiography um, and uh, just incredible saints. Hey, Father, before we take off, um, I have a quick question. All right, I have three things to th I have three things. Sorry, why is hagi or uh, hagiography? Why is it written the way that it is? Um, because it's not like an accurate. It's not like a literal transcript or like a literal account of what happened correct it's like like because it talks about like saints so here's the thing hagiography is written in a way for you to experience as much as possible the reality of what occurred and so this is why saint Por saint porfidios he says a christian must have the soul of a poet because there's a poetic aspect to hagiography, which is absolutely necessary because certain things can only be articulated um, in a poetic sense. There's certain things that can only be articulated. There's certain spiritual truths that can only be grasped through the kind of symbolic facet of poetic language and hagi and specifically, you know, hagiography has its is its own kind of um, its own kind of. Uh, what would the term be? It has its own literary um, uh, aspects, right? Because it isn't it isn't quite poetry, although there's poetic aspects to it. It isn't quite symbolism the way that most people understand symbolism, although there's symbolic aspects to it. And the reason for that is because there are things that, um, like in the icon, there's certain um, there's certain iconographic. Um, uh, devices that are used to communicate something that is um, impossible to, to experience otherwise. So for instance, a mandorla and an icon, the, the kind of like um, uh, progressive uh, rings, halos that you'll see behind, like let's say in the icon of the transfiguration where it's moving from dark in the center out to lighter, these things, the mandorla is there to, to demonstrate something happening 
um, only visibly in a spiritual context, right? How else do you communicate that visually? So there's things like that in, in much of hagiography is like that in regards to it's communicating a deeper truth than the, liter than the literal sense of the thing, right? Okay, because yeah, it. I, I heard a priest talk about, and it's, it's, I think it was Father Cosmos. I think it was talking about like the saint, the saint bore all with Christian patience, you know, something like that in the line. But, you know, he talks about like how sometimes we can get overwhelmed because it's like the saint, it's like the saint didn't cry when they were being tortured, but like they did cry. Like, you know, like they were obviously probably like screamed out in pain or something like that. You, do you know what I mean, Father? Like, it's not yeah. like a literal depiction of what happened. Yeah, yeah. And again, some of that is just because of our bad reading of it. Because it's you, not like those things are necessarily hidden from. I mean, they're not necessarily omitted for the sense of like trying to make it, you know. The same seem cooler or something. Yeah, it's not that. It's just that, um, like, is it really important that we tell people you have a freckle on your lower left cheek? Like if, if you, if, if, you know, something laughable, like, like the real path, like does some crazy, amazing thing for people in the future. They're like, who is this guy? Andrew Funk, you know, it's like, is it really important that you have a freckle on your left? Like, I mean, is it like, although you may talk about your love of rye, does it really matter? <laughs> like, true. you know true. what I'm saying? Like, like you have to kind of look at it, I think from that perspective. Sure. But father, what bread did he like though? What was his favorite bread though, father? Right. It's very important. Right. Right. You know what I mean? People would be like, what? You know what I mean? So I think that I think that's the thing with the saints is that people miss that aspect. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And then the second thing was uh it's just a thought, but I if I don't say it here, where else should I say it? But I was my we just got a van, my family and I, and I was driving around. And it was my wife and my kids and I. And I was like, man, this is even like an icon of a family. Because here I am like behind the driver's you know, seat. And then my wife, who's kind of like guiding me of where to go. And then like my kids in the back trusted with, you know, that I'm kind of trusting whatever. Yeah, that sounded better in my brain. But that it occurred to me. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's even a little icon. And then the third one that I wanted to tell earlier, and I guess we can just end on this, um, was that there's a story I heard about St. Porfirio, Porfirios, um, and uh, there was these nuns visiting him, and they had to uh, get back to their monastery. And it, it's one of those things where it's another one of like visceral how clear it is who I am in this story. But the abbess was like really trying to get going, but Saint because they needed to make it back by eight o'clock, and it was like a six hour drive, something like that. Blah blah blah. And it was getting to be about two o'clock. They really needed to go, and she was like, okay. You go with St. Porfirios was like, come in, sit down, have some tea. And then like they, he wanted to like talk to each nun and like the abbess is sitting there just getting more and more worked up. She's like, we're going to sleep in the bus tonight. Like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Like, you know, and so she's like, father, you know, with your blessing, I'd really like to go. He's like, no, 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 not yet. Not yet. Not yet. And just kind of kept going two hours, two, three hours go by. She's like, father, I absolutely insist with your blessing. We have to leave. So, okay, okay, okay. You know, and so they get in the bus and they drive and they're driving and they're driving and whatever. And then they get, and the, the lady at the front gate of the monastery is like letting them in or whatever. She's like, oh yeah. You know, they're like, did we drive all night and they're opening up again for us? Like, did we drive into the morning and they're opening the monastery gates for us? And they're like, oh my gosh, how long did that drive take? And then the, they asked the, the nun who was manning the gate, what time is it? So it's 7.30. Like, you guys are fine. And then as soon as the abbess, like, gets into her home or whatever, and she's like, how did it only take us, like, two hours to drive that whole way? Like, a phone rings, and she picks it up, and St. Porfirios is just kind of laughing. He's like, how was your drive? You know? <laughs> oh, did you make it on time? Were you that worried about it? And she's like, oh, that's so wild. <laughs> Yeah. What a mercy. Oh, mercy. Yeah. But what, it's so wow. clear who I am in that story because I'm the abbess freaking out. Like, and you can you can quote me on that. I'm the abbess freaking out, Andrew Funk, 2020. <laughs> I I uh I will uh 
acknowledge I am also the abbess freaking out. Yeah. I will acknowledge that. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, next week. If I'm maybe... opening the gate. <laughs> <laughs> or I'm the bus driver who's not even acknowledging anything is happening. Like just, seat, just like reading comic books or something just like oh i guess the nun's got to get going <laughs> um okay so uh i'm just gonna throw this out there again that the we have a playlist on spotify of all the music including the stuff we talked about last week that has been mentioned in the show not all of it because i'm i'm not going to go back and listen to all of it i'd listen to all of us to find all the music we talked about but if we mentioned somebody i'd try and throw it on there it's Royal Path Podcast Music on Spotify. So if you guys want to check that out, um, everything we've ever talked about, more or less. Um, and then we'll be back next week, God willing. Um, and again, questions, comments, all that kind of stuff. And thank you for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.